Well, I'm delighted for the latest in our series of interviews for UK Cigar Scene magazine to welcome Derek Harris. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Derek started in the tobacco industry back in 1952 uh, and has, uh, uh, after a long and uh, illustrious career, retired as the chairman and managing director of Melbourne Heart. And we'll talk more about Melbourne Heart, but uh, a, a year, uh, sorry, a, a career in, in tobacco and in cigars. And from the discussions we've had leading up to the interview, it sounds like you had a very interesting and enjoyable career, Derek. Oh, indeed. Full of fun. Full of fun and happiness. I look back on it with a great deal of happiness. Wonderful. And what, what brought you into tobacco in the in the first place what, what brought you into well, the industry originally my grandfather had a tobacconist shop in Woolwich which my father inherited and he turned it into a wholesale business and developed that to a, a fine wholesale tobacco business he became president of the wholesale tobacco trade association and I suppose when I came out of the army it perhaps was assumed I was going to follow in the footsteps, but I didn't do that. I went off and became a trainee initially at Singleton and Cole, who were big wholesale tobacconists in Birmingham, and then subsequently I became a trainee at Carreras, okay. and I worked in Carreras for a bit, and so I learnt a bit about the trade at all angles. Where were Carreras? Were Carreras Nottingham? No, Carreras were in Hampstead. Oh, right. They, they were... The, the oh, goodness, of course. Carreras. The Black Cat. Black Cat, yeah. Ah, Traven A. Famous, yes. That famous factory. Yes. And then yes. Uh, you moved from there to, to Melbourne Heart. Then I got invited to become um, a director of Melbourne Heart and Company at the age of about 30 and um, learnt a lot about cigars from the then chairman Cecil Melbourne Hart who was the doyen of the cigar trade and I was very lucky to work with him. And what, what most people, most people today who see all the Cuban cigars coming in through Habanos in, in, in Havana and then into to Hunters and Franco, what a lot of people maybe don't realise is back then there were a number of cigar importers, it was quite a diverse business wasn't oh, it? Oh indeed. They were, and they all had their own brands, which they effectively represented for the various factories in Cuba. Right. And so we, as, <coughs> as uh, importers, had, we were lucky we owned our own brands, but other people were agents for them. Right. And they were big importers, and the, the brands they brought in were big. A Melbourne Heart, which brands back then would Melbourne Heart have had? Well, our big ones were Punch, which we owned, and Hoyo de Monterey. They were the two big ones. Right. As far as Havana cigars were concerned. And the other one which we owned was Macanudo, which was the biggest selling Jamaican cigar. Ah, okay, okay. And, and back then, the, the, the industry, I'm sure, was, was, was very, was different. How, how were... I mean, this is we, we're talking sort of back in the nineteen fifties <coughs> and sixties, so sort of pre-revolutionary. Yet the, 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 um, yeah, the revolution had just begun, really. Then, right? You, but we were on quota, okay. So there was a limit to the amount we could bring in a dollar quota, right? And the dollar, the Cuban peso, was related to the U.S. dollar as far as exchange rates were concerned, mm -hmm. and there was only an amount we were allowed according to our quota, and the quota had been based on the um, amount you brought in prior to 1939. Right. Now it just so happened that Melbourne Hut had had a, a bumper year in importing a lot of cigars, so by chance they had the largest quota. I see. Which helped a lot, because yeah. which meant we were able to bring in, so we had more cigars to sell than the others did. Right. But it was a very friendly trade in, then, it was, they were, because Quite frankly, um, we didn't have to compete um, because you could sell all that you could get. Right, right. Okay. And then, so, I mean, a trip to Havana back in those days, or a trip to, to Cuba to go and see the factories, 
must have been something of a must have been a, a been an interesting trip, I would imagine, wasn't it? Oh, I was the first. I think I was the first to go to Cuba after the Cuban Revolution. Right. And first of all, to get the visa was a major undertaking. Right. And then I had to fly to Madrid and then fly from Madrid non-stop to Havana in a propeller-driven aeroplane, which right. I think took 13 hours. Goodness me. Goodness um, me. It really was. And I was greeted as a very, very special person right. because they, the Cuba Tobacco, which had been the monopoly which had been developed by the Cuban government, hadn't had any visitors from overseas, so they made a big fuss of me. Right. And so the revolution, at that time the revolution had just happened? Just happened, yes. Right. And what was, the, what was, uh, what was Havana like? What did you, how did you find Havana when you well, arrived? Nearly all the shops were closed. There were no shops. Right. Um, everything was rationed. People were having a pretty rough time. Right. Um, and it was very difficult. I mean, the things, one liked to take little gifts out to them. And the things which we, you know, the best thing which one could have taken out, which I wasn't able to do, was a bar of chocolate. So, right. you know, I, I took things like silk ties, which were in rela thoughts now were really not very popular. Right. <laughs> so coming back then to, to the industry in, in, uh, in London and, and, and your, your, round, your sales round, let's talk mm. a little about the, some of your customers and the sorts of people who you'd... Uh, you'd visit with uh, to, to sell cigars? Well, they were, first of all, because I was comparatively young, I was only about 34, 33, 34, and I was the young man. And although I'd been in the trade and representing a very good company, everybody was so much more old than me and right. so much more, quote, respectable. Right. So I used to go and see the manager, Mr. D, at Dunhill's morning coat, very spectral, right, and very pleased to see me, but um, you know, didn't realise that I was thirty-three and he must have been fifty-five, right. And um, of course, oh, you've not been in the trade very long. You see, I've been in it fifty years, and when you've been in this as long as me, you'll know a bit more about it, young man. <laughs> and I can remember saying to one person, it's because I'm meeting people like you, sir, that I am learning a bit about it, which helped a bit. <laughs> um, they, everybody was very friendly, They're always mm. pleased to see you, and one used to do the circuit, like sort of almost every week. Right. Because whilst there was a limit to the number of Havana cigars one could sell, yeah. and um, there was always a big demand for other good cigars. Right. And we had Macanudo, right. which was a big selling cigar. And of course, that was a beautiful cigar. And that was from Jamaica? Jamaica. Interesting. With a Cuban wrapper. Ah, OK. And they looked beautiful. They were beautiful cigars. Right. And they were a bit cheaper. Uh -huh. But let's be honest about it, take the band off and smoke them and very few people could tell the difference. Right, right. So Dunhill was one of the, uh, one of the spots on, oh, your, on your round. Absolutely. Where, where else did you... Uh... Well, I used to go to Robert Lewis down here, yes. just down here, yeah. and used to see them. They were very friendly and it was John Crowley was the person I used right. to see there. Right. And John Crowley was a very, very kind, nice man, very, very generous. Right. And one had to be very careful when one went to see him because having done the business, he used to say, well, come and have a drink. And he was a gentleman who loved his whiskey. Right. And he didn't like to drink on his own. <laughs> one had to be very careful when one went to see him that it was the last call. Right, <laughs> okay. And organized that yes, accordingly. But he, was, he was very good, and very nice. <coughs> and the major stores, Selfridges, mm -hmm. had a big tobacco department. Right, right. As, as did the Army and Navy okay, in Victoria. Uh -huh. And Harrods. Yes. Harrods had an enormous one. And right. they all had their own maturing rooms there. And of course, the thing was, um, they used to have their own labels. We used to print ah, labels. Right. So we used to 
for example, like Petit Corona, we would take the label off saying Petit Corona and yeah. it would be called Harrods Number no. 7 or something right. like that. Right, right. I understand. Which made it, as far as Harrods were concerned, uh, much better. Yes, very, very exclusive. Yes. Very special. Exclusive. And we talked a little about one specific store, famous, uh, famous place in London for, for the gentleman that no longer sells cigars, but which was one of, a, one of your big customers. Oh, well, you are, are we referring to um, the, the lovely hairdressers? Yes. Or gentlemen's yes. hairdressers. Yes. Um, Trumpers. Yes. I was sent to see Trumpers, and the lady who owned Trumpers was a Miss Trumper, and she was a very distinguished, lovely lady of about 45 or 50, tall, very elegant. And I went to see her, and she said, Oh, yes, um, do come through. Sat me in a, a little place where they normally would cut people's hair in one of the lovely chairs. Mm. And she then produced an order for me. And I think the order was something like 40,000 Havana cigars, mm. all in cabinet boxes of 25, all with their name printed on the side. And in those days, the factory used to do that, of course, print, print the boxes. Yes. And so I can remember going to see her. I only had to go once a year because when they came in, she didn't want to see you again. No, we've got everything we wanted. And of course, in those days, gentlemen used to go in there. It was the one place they could go and buy cigars without their wives being able to look over their shoulders to see what they were spending their money on. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. It's a, yes, a, a, well, Trumpers is a, is a, does sort of take you back to a different age, doesn't it? Anyway, Absolutely. Still today. And we, we did something for them because they were very big and important, important customer <coughs> and a unique customer. Mm. We gave them a lovely silver, a lovely brass um, Mr. Punch, which they had on the top of a staircase, uh -huh. which used to have a flame coming out. Right. And so the gentleman, having lit their it was, it was, it was um, I used it, plumbed up to the gas. Oh, goodness. Oh, and right. And a little jet, little gas jet came yes. out. And the gentleman used to take their cigars and then used to go and light it. <laughs> oh, how so wonderful. So they used to go out. Wonderful. In those days, whereas you don't see many people walking along smoking cigars today, in those days it was much more common to see people, A, smoking a pipe and right. secondly smoking a cigar. Right. How wonderful. How wonderful. Oh, that's marvellous. That's marvellous. So, your, your life in, in the cigars, you started in, at, at Melbourne Heart, you started as a director, but out yes. selling, selling to, to, yes. to the public, out to the stores. And then you moved through the ranks at Melbourne Heart. Tell us a little about Melbourne Heart as a company. And well, Melbourne Heart, one has to say that they're a very important company. And Cecil Melbourne Heart was the doyen of the industry. Mm. He was very well known and highly, highly respected by everybody. And of course, he was quite old then. He must have been in his early 70s. And so when he used to go and see somebody, they all respected him because he was actually older than most of the customers. <laughs> Right. Um, but he'd had a very interesting career and he told me the story, which I will repeat to you if I may, mm. of when he was a young man he, and the First World War started, he was told that the place to go and see was the Nathi because the officers were going overseas uh -huh, and yes. they needed cigars. Right. Over and over in France, yeah, and so he went to see the buyer of the naffy, and he had to sit down and wait his turn to go in, and the man said yes, you know, and he told him what he was doing and that sort of thing, and he said right, he said and he gave him a substantial order, and he said will you come back next week, and so the following week he went back and he sat down and waited his turn and went in, and the chap gave him another substantial order and said, come back next week. And every time, because the troops were going across to France, mm. it was getting bigger. Right. And one has to recognize the soldiers needed, the officers needed their cigars. Yeah, yes. So this went on for some time. And then Cecil eventually got his call-up papers. 
and he went to see um, the buyer, as was the normal case, and he said, Mr. Brown, I'm afraid I won't be here next week. I've got to go. I'm being called up. Oh, gracious me, what's going to happen? Well, I don't know what's going to happen, sir, because um, I'm going and I don't know my brother's already in the army. I don't know what's going to happen. So the buyer said to him, well, under those circumstances, I think what you better do is to write out an order for the next 12 months <laughs> and I'll sign it. So if you'd like to do that now. And so Cecil Hart proceeded to write down the order and work it out according to, based on what he'd sold in the past months. Yes. Over, and it came to over seven million cigars. Seven, seven million Havana wow. cigars. And the man signed it. There and then, wow. And Cecil went back and showed it to his brother, or his partners, whoever they were at that yep. time, and they were so thrilled with him, they gave him a gold cigarette case to go and put in his pocket when he went to yeah, France. How wonderful, how so that's amazing. That's probably the biggest order ever. Ever for cigars, wow, how extraordinary. That's amazing. And so, where were Melbourne Heart based in London? Where well, was their, originally their they were based in Basinghall St Street in the city, mm -hmm. and then they moved from there to Barnard's Inn in Hoban. Right. And we were there. <coughs> and subsequently, as the Hart brothers got old, they came to the conclusion they sold the business. Wow. Uh -huh. And they sold it to Godfrey Phillips, or to put it another way around, Godfrey Phillips bought them. Right. Godfrey Phillips, who were a big cigarette company right. and wanting to diverse. Well, Melbourne Hart was extremely popular and very, very profitable. Mm. And so they bought. But they kept Cecil on as president. Right. And um, they, that's when they asked me to come in as a director. Right. And I followed Cecil in his footsteps and became chairman and then managing, managing director and then chairman. And you're telling me a lovely story about Cecil. We were talking a little about the way to educate young men in the cigar industry. You're telling me a lovely story about what Cecil did uh, as he went round to visit the various stores. Well, what he used to do, which was really quite clever, um, when he used to go out to Havana every year, he used to go and, of course, he was greeted, you can imagine, the factory's biggest customer when he went out, Fernando Policio, who owned the, owned the punch factory, used to bend over backwards, anything Cecil wanted, he could have. And he used to say to him, oh, I tell you what, would you please get me 500 Cuban postcards? And so he used to get these postcards and he used to bring them back to England. And then during the course of the year, as he was going around visiting people, he would go into a shop or a store and he would talk to the young person behind the counter, the young trainee or the assistant, and find out what their name was. And he'd make a note of it. So he'd go into Selfridges, for example. Although he went in to see Mr. Rook, who was the manager, he would talk to the young man and say, what's your name? And the chap would say, oh, my name's George, so George Smith. Oh, good, well, nice to meet you. And I'm, I've come to see Mr. Rook, but Will you tell him I'm here? But it's very nice to meet you, George. And he would make a note of George Smith's name. He'd come back to his office and he'd say to his secretary, George Smith, Tobacco Department, Selfridges. And his secretary would write a card then and there and put on it, arrived safely, weather, weather good, crop looking excellent, nice, best wishes, Cecil Hart. <laughs> and when he went out to Cuba the next year, he would take all these 500 cards with him, which his secretary had written, yeah. give them to the factory. The factory used to put stamp, Cuban stamps on and post them. And of course, you can imagine 60 years ago, yeah. in those days, to receive a postcard from um, Cuba, from the chairman of Melbourne Heart and Company, yeah. was a great thing. And of course, public relations wise, it was a did wonders to him. Absolutely fantastic. Everybody I knew him. Yes. And everybody regarded I, him. Oh. And everybody as they came up through the industry yes. remembered for that, that, yes. for, for, for that. How wonderful. And you were telling me that sometimes when, um, that uh, even back then, that uh, circumstances in, in Cuba, the, the factories would sometimes find themselves a little strapped. And that led to some interesting, uh, interesting deals. 
Well, the factory, I suppose, in answer to it, yes. Um, I think they probably led a very good life above their income. Mm. And um, one day the factory, Fernando Felicio said to Cecil, um, we're wonder if you could give us another order because we're you know, a bit tight and the bank would like to make sure we're going to have a decent order. And Cecil said, well, we've just given you an enormous order. You know, what do you want another one for? He said, well, to satisfy the bank. He said, well, what, what's the problem? He said, well, the problem is that, you know, I'm a bit strapped for cash. So Cecil said, well, what else is there? The outcome of it was, he said, well, I tell you what we'll buy. We'll buy the Punch brand and the Hoyo de Monterey brand from you. And of course, Fernando Policio was delighted to sell those because they were um, selling to their biggest customer and by doing so, maintaining yep. a long-term right. relationship. Yes, yes. And for Melbourne, Hart & Company were unique in owning the brands because the importers in England in those days were just, quotes, agents. Right, right. I understand. Interesting. Well, yeah, it's... Uh, yes, yeah, though those, those were the days. Yes. And so let, let's talk a little about Macanudo, because that's a, it's a, it's a, a cigar or a name that, that's, that's come back again now, isn't it? But what, 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 what was the background then? Well, the Mac Macanudo was um, created... And the reason it was created um, was the Prince of Wales had a, a, did a worldwide visit in the, I suppose, mid-30s, went round the world, and he was looked upon by everyone as, you know, the future king. He was a very good-looking man. Everywhere he went, he was photographed, went all over the world, mm. and he was seen doing all the best things, playing polo with the millionaires, dancing with all the beautiful girls, everything was superb. And he went to the Argentine. And while he was in the Argentine, he played polo and did all these things. And at the end of the fortnight that he was there, they gave a dinner for him. And they asked him if he would make a speech, in which he got up to make a speech. And he had advice from his aides and that sort of thing. And the word Macanudo in Spanish is a fabulous time, a great time. Mm. And so he said, you know, I've enjoyed being here for a fortnight, it's been wonderful, and I have had a Macanudo. However, in the Argentine, the word Macanudo means large erection. <laughs> <laughs> Consequently. <laughs> Now, so that's an evening not to be forgotten by the Argentinians. No, and you can imagine all the, all the local papers and the Argentinian papers the next day had Prince of Wales has Macanudo. <laughs> but the clever thing was, Fernando Policio went straight out and registered the name as a trademark. Right, right. And out, the outcome of that was that he produced a cigar which was a bit bigger than a petty Corona, but a bit smaller than a Corona. Right. And it was a very special one. And in those days, of course, um, the president of Cuba, when anybody came to visit him, always gave them as a leaving present a box of cigars. Right. And the uh, Cuban manufacturers used to work hard to try and get, it was their cigars that were given away for obvious reasons, because right. when you went back to England, having seen the president and you were given one of these, these must be the best, so yes. it's wonderful public relations. They always gave the cigars for nothing. So Fernando Felicio made an arrangement. He gave the president of Cuba these cigars and they were called Macanudo, Punch Macanudo. Oh, I see, I see. And yes. that was a special size. Right. And of course, it was double thick, because you can imagine the, the underlying humour <laughs> there was with the president giving somebody a box of Macanudo. <laughs> so Macanudo, so when Macanudo was both uh, a, the name of a cigar from yes. Cuba, but then a brand. It became a brand when the war started, right. 39 war started, uh -huh. and there was a limit to the amount of 
Cuban tobacco you could bring into this country. Right. So they set up a factory in Jamaica, uh -huh. and they made Jamaican cigars right. using Havana wrappers. I as see. And they were beautiful cigars. But so under the auspices of a... <coughs> and a, a, they a, named them Macanudo. Uh -huh. And if you look at the two boxes, they are very similar. Right. They are of a similar nature to... The punch is very similar to Macanudo for that perfect reason. Got it. Got and Macanudo became a very big selling Jamaican cigar. Interesting. Interesting. Now, you told me also, when we, we talked some while ago, you talked me about some, some interesting and famous... Uh, people who were who were cigar smokers who ultimately were your your customers one one <coughs> in particular who maybe was famous for for being a pipe smoker but was actually a cigar smoker well we used to supply a gentleman with cigars who in turn supplied a, a, a pipe smoking prime minister and this pipe smoking prime minister was always known for smoking a pipe mm -hmm. And everywhere he went, he was seen smoking a pipe. Right. But any time he was on his own, he used to smoke our cigars, and they were of the fi absolutely finest cigars. And he used to smoke a large quantity of them. <laughs> but in public, he always smoked always a pipe. Always seen piping, smoke, smoking a pipe. Yes. And his name was? Harold Wilson. <laughs> yes, Harold Wilson. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Lovely. Well, it's been it's been wonderful, and uh, and I know we're, there are going to be a lots lots there are lots more stories to come out, but we only have a limited amount of time. So that's been wonderful. We're going to finish today with the three questions we uh, um, we like to ask. We know you're, you're a little chesty, so you haven't had a cigar today. But where where do you where do you like to enjoy a cigar? Where's your favourite place to enjoy a cigar? Well, I don't smoke quite so much as I used to now. When I used to smoke quite a lot, the thing I used to love to do was to take my dog for a walk mm. and smoke a Havana cigar. Wonderful. And walking along, smoking a Havana cigar in the woods with my dog was uh -huh. always my absolute top pleasure. <laughs> Lovely. And when you weren't walking with a cigar, what did you like to, uh, to drink with a cigar? What's your favorite oh, tip? I think a really nice glass of brandy. Yes, a lovely glass of brandy with a cigar is something very special. Excellent, excellent. And then if we can think, if you can think back about one, one cigar that was a, a really memorable cigar that you enjoyed, what would, you, uh, what would that be? Well, I did smoke a cigar in Havana on one occasion, which was given to me by a, one of Fidel Castro's number one people, who was called General Castanara. Mm. And he produced a very special cigar, which he gave to me. And I have to say, that I do remember so particularly smoking the cigar. I remember taking a lot of trouble in cutting the top off so that I did it nicely because I didn't want to offend him. Mm. And I do remember him biting the top off and spitting <laughs> it out and him just lighting it, although it was just another cigar. To me, that was one which was very, very special. Oh, fantastic. How fantastic. Derek, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I've, again, I've learned a huge amount um, and uh, it's been most enjoyable. So thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you very much.